This video is brought to you by World Anvil. Good morning interweb. So way back in 2015, half a decade ago, I made a video called If Planets Were Donuts. Ever since I've wanted to make a follow on video about flat planets. Alas, peak flat earth hysteria reigned, so I thought better of it. Fortunately, the flat earth conspiracy is, at the time of this recording, all but a dead meme. So I figure now's my chance to talk about flat planets in the context of sci-fi and fantasy world building. The plan is to break down the flat earth model by category, outline and explain what's wrong with their hypotheses, and then speculate as to what possible variations might be open to us as world builders. Let's world build. Most flat earthers either implicitly or explicitly believe in a thing called zetetagism. It's a nonsense term made up by the infamous charlatan Samuel Rowbottom in his 1865 book Zetetic Astronomy, Earth is Not a Globe. I know this because despite my better judgement, I purchased the book. Worst 99 pence I have ever spent. On the face of it, zetetic thinking sounds legit, but under hood it's a deeply anti-scientific, hubristic worldview that is tantamount to, if I personally perceive a thing to be a certain way, it necessarily is that way. To Robotham and other flat earthers, the earth appears to them to be flat, therefore it is. The sun appears to evolve around the earth, therefore it does. Planetary science, orbital mechanics, astronomy, astrophysics, pfft, nah, that's all just quote, speculative, imaginary, not tangible, scheming. The flat earth model is rooted in this misguided zeteticism, although no flat earther is consistent in their zetetic outlook, as we'll soon see. It feels like we're living on a non-rotating flat plane, so according to the flat earth model, we are. Flat earthers imagine the earth as a non-rotating circular disk with the North Pole in the centre, the continents radiating outwards, and Antarctica wrapping around the circumference forming a 50 to 60 metre high ice wall that holds the oceans in. Why this configuration? Well, I guess some bright spark stumbled across the azimuthal equidistant projection and thought, wow, purdy. Not this azimuthal equidistant projection, mind. Remember kids, Northern Hemisphere chauvinism must always be maintained. And yes, the flat earth map is a projection of a sphere. I know, the irony. In reality, flat planets cannot exist naturally, so if you want to have one in your setting, it's going to need to be constructed. Aliens, gods, whatever, as long as it's not a naturally occurring body. As such, flat planets can be made any size, shape or thickness. Square, circle, bestagon, who cares? Gravity is the reason flat planets can't exist naturally. Gravity would crush any planetary scale mass down into a sphere. This is why all flat earthers simply state that gravity doesn't exist. Instead, they say that what we call gravity is actually just density and buoyancy. So like a rock dropped from a height, cause it's denser than air, will always fall down. No, not that down. No, no, yes, that down. Helium balloons float upwards cause of the buoyant force, which in no way, shape or form is reliant on gravity whatsoever. Abject nonsense, and doesn't offer an explanation as to why the earth is flat. A minority of flat earthers assert that the effects of gravity are actually caused by the flat earth accelerating upwards. So the rock doesn't so much fall to the ground, the ground falls to the rock. This is also nonsense, and also doesn't explain why the earth is flat. And anyways, what causes this acceleration? What are we accelerating towards? Answer, who knows? Simply dismissing a fundamental force is silly and will lead to major problems down the road. So let's assume our constructive flat planet has been built to be gravity resistant, but gravity still acts on it as normal. If our flat planet were perfectly homogeneous, gravity would act on it like so, its vectors always pointing to the center of mass. Unlike the flat earth model, this would make both faces of the disk potentially habitable. In the centre of each face, everything would feel quite earth-like. However, moving towards the edges would feel like climbing up and down increasingly steep slopes, cause the direction of gravity's pull will be constantly changing so as to always point back to the centre of mass. The planet would look like this, sure, but would feel more like this. These ascents and descents may feel too extreme to undertake, so inhabitants on one face may never meet those on the other. Maybe they are totally unaware of each other's existence. Maybe they are able to infer each other's existence. Or maybe they have the tech needed to tunnel through to the other side. In all cases, imagine the rich cultural implications of such a setup. A fun thought experiment would be to take things to infinity. There is no centre of mass on an infinite plane, so the gravitational field would be uniform, 
always pointing perpendicular to the plane. And no matter how far away you go from the plane, you'll still always record the same gravitational acceleration. But the really fun thing is that standing on an infinite plane would feel like standing on the interior of a hollow sphere. See, gravity causes light to curve. On Earth, this deflection is very, 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 very slight. On an infinite plane, the distances are extreme. Therefore, the deflection is also extreme. Light from this really, really, really distant point will eventually curve back to the plane. Our brains perceive light as having traveled in straight lines. So this point will appear to have come from somewhere in the sky. Therefore, assuming no obstructions like planets or stars, the entire sky will be filled with images of the surface of the plane. Infinite flat earth equals infinite hollow earth. How cool is that? Without gravity, holding on to an atmosphere and oceans is impossible. So the flat earth model forwards the idea of a dome or firmament, a hemispherical structure enclosing the flat earth. This is unzetetic. No flat earther has ever seen this dome firsthand. Again, a small minority of flat earthers take this dome thing and really run with it, using it to explain tides and plate tectonics. They see the dome as spherical. The flat earth lies in the middle, floating atop an ocean. Vibrations caused by the Earth bobbing up and down on the surface of this ocean cause the tides. Tectonic activity is caused by the buildup and release of tension as the flat Earth scrapes up and down the dome, firmament, glass bobble thing. All of this is clearly ridiculous. Our flat planet has regular gravity, so it will be able to hold onto oceans and an atmosphere, sorta of sans dome. Air and water will pool as close as possible to the center of gravity, so we might expect to see a rim continent, a central ocean dotted with land masses, and a central atmospheric bubble defining the habitable and uninhabitable regions of our flat planet. This means one might be able to literally walk out of the atmosphere and into space. Pretty dope. Tides would be explained by the gravitational interactions of a moon. Plate tectonics, however, will be a problem. On Earth, plate tectonics occur due to the relative movements of the crustal plates over the molten upper portion of the mantle. Our flat planet doesn't have a rotating iron core or molten mantle, so no plate tectonics. No recycling of important chemicals and minerals, no new landmass creation, and worst of all, no magnetic field. This means our unshielded flat planet will have zero protection from stellar winds and cosmic radiation its atmosphere will be prone to being stripped away, and our flat planet inhabitants will be bombarded by ionized radiation. We could suspend disbelief here and say that the atmosphere and oceans will hang around long enough for inhabitants to engineer a solution to the problem of atmospheric loss. And we could also say that they have evolved to cope with the bombardment of ionized particles. This is admittedly silly, but definitely less silly than invoking a space snow globe. The sun and the moon appear to evolve around the Earth, so in the flat Earth model, they do, orbiting around the North Pole, moving between the tropics over the course of a year. Apparently, the sun begins its journey at the Tropic of Capricorn and spirals polewards towards the Tropic of Cancer, gradually slowing down as it moves poleward. When it reaches the Tropic of Cancer, it reverses course, spirals rimward and speeds up. Rinse and repeat. When the sun is over the Tropic of Capricorn, it's the winter solstice. When it's over the equator, we have the spring or autumnal equinoxes. And when it's over the Tropic of Cancer, we have the summer solstice. The moon apparently follows a similar path, except it doesn't speed up and slow down. I think this is how flat earthers explain how the sun and moon can be seen in the sky at the same time. Honestly though, I'm not sure. From a physics standpoint, this all makes no sense. Further, the sun and the moon appear to be the same size. Therefore, in the flat earth model, they are. They appear to be close to Earth, therefore they are. Some estimate both to be about 50 kilometers in diameter and about 5,000 kilometers away from Earth. The sun acts like a spotlight, only illuminating an arbitrary portion of the disk so as to maintain the day-night cycle we see. And the moon appears to emit its own light, therefore it does. Why do the sun and the moon orbit in these spirals? What causes the sun to slow down and speed up in its orbit so as to maintain a constant 24 hour day? What is the sun if not a star? What causes it to act like a spotlight? How does the moon emit light? Again, who knows and really, who cares? Zeteticism, am I right? The sun and moon don't rise or set on the flat earth because they orbit above the plane. Instead, the apparent setting of the sun and moon is explained using a misapplication of perspective. As the sun and moon move away from the observer, they would appear to shrink in the sky and vanish. This despite clear zetetic evidence to the contrary. 
But remember, we can pick and choose when to be zetetic so as to confirm our pre-existing conspiratorial beliefs. This geocentric model is incredibly unrealistic. Low mass stuff orbits high mass stuff, not the other way around. So let's have our flat planet spin about its axis and orbit a normal non-local star, just like Earth does the Sun. Unlike Earth, our flat planet won't have seasons, tilt or not, and all parts of the disk will receive the same heating. So the entire planet would have the same climate. There will probably be some temperature variations due to the differences in atmospheric thickness by latitude, but I suspect these effects will be negligible. Our flat planet can also have a non-local moon, just like Earth, and everything will be more or less Earth-like. Tides, eclipses, etc. The setting and rising of these bodies would also be like on Earth. Now, if you really wanted to maintain geocentrism, you can do something like this, albeit it'll have to be justified by magic or divine intervention or something. Again, the sun and moon are non-local here. In this scenario, the day-night cycle on a geocentric flat planet would be equal to half the orbital period of the star. So if the star were to take one Earth year to orbit the flat planet, days and nights would be six months long. Even if we place a geocentric flat planet as close as possible to the lowest habitable mass star possible, we'd still be looking at a minimum of about 40 Earth day, days and nights. And in all cases, there would be no seasons. I mean, over geological time, sure, seasons would occur due to orbital precession, but they'd last for a long, long time, and all of the flat planet would experience the same season at the same time. Also, given that the day-night cycle is caused by the orbit of the star, there's no need to have your geocentric flat planet rotate on its axis. Like the star, any moon would need to, by definition, orbit the geocentric flat planet. If placed on an inner orbit, eclipses would occur, but always along a specific path, assuming of course negligible orbital eccentricity and orbital inclination. And finally, the setting and rising of these bodies will be like on Earth, albeit they'll only set and rise once per orbit. When we look at the night sky, all the background stars look like tiny little lights, therefore, in the flat earth model, they are. They also appear to be embedded on the dome firmament thing, therefore, they are. To the northern hemisphere chauvinist Polaris, the north star, appears to be the only stationary light, therefore, it is. All the other stars orbit around it, planetarium style, in concentric circles, therefore, they do. This makes the Flat Earth and Polaris the only two stationary objects in the whole entire universe. Aren't they special? Now, it's unclear to me as to whether the prevailing idea is that the dome rotates and the stars are fixed on the dome, or that the stars rotate and the dome is fixed. Either way, it's all nonsense. Five of these tiny lights appear to wander the firmament, tracing out spirograph-like orbits. Therefore, they literally do. In reality, these five lights are the naked eye planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, and their apparent motion is a consequence of their orbits and the heliocentric model. In our heliocentric model, the background stars and planets will work just like they do in our solar system. In our geocentric model, the background stars will, again, by definition, need to orbit the flat planet. If our geocentric flat planet doesn't spin, and these stars are on distant enough orbits, which they will be, they will appear to be eternally fixed and stationary. No star trails. So that was that. The Flat Earth model and some space pizza ramblings done. If you're interested in hearing more about flat planets, particularly from a geoengineering angle, go check out Isaac Arthur's Megastructures Flat Earths. It is an absolute banger. You will love it. Laters. Good morning Interweb, this video is brought to you by World Anvil, the ultimate world building platform for game masters and writers. World Anvil is a browser based set of world building tools that will help you create, organize and store your creations. Interactive wiki like articles, maps, calendars, historical timelines and family trees. World Anvil's got it all. They even have an RPG campaign manager and full blown novel writing software. Try World Anvil today for free by clicking the link in the description, that way they'll know you've came from this video. Big thanks to World Anvil for sponsoring the show, World Anvil the ultimate world building platform and TT RPG campaign manager. This video is also brought to you by you, the patrons, in particular, Johan Spadke, Spencer Brownlee, Alexander Roper, Andrew P. Shahail, John Huyer, Ripta Passe and World Anvil. I hope you all enjoyed and until next time, Edgar Ellis.